Folks, this is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. As the tidbits read in the book of Ephesians, Paul the Apostle, writing to the Ephesians in about 64 AD, and in chapter 1, as he introduces something, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So now he's introducing himself, who he is, and you got to remember, these writings were on parchment, and they were few and far apart. And they weren't like we have today. We just open the book, and we take for granted, and we read very clearly what it says. But in that day, it wasn't so. They would get a parchment, and they would have to uh, learn what that said. And right here, the apostle, he stands as the leader of the church and does so by a special message. He brings with Paul, it was grace. And he said, I'm bringing you this grace by the will of God. <laughs> and that's how I'm bringing it to you. This was the foundation of Paul's calling. As, as he called those, it was his foundation. And he, he was preaching to the saints. That's all those who have asked Jesus to forgive them of their sin and become saints. Uh, which once became upon accepting Christ. When you instantly, the instant that you accept Christ, you become a saint of God. You are in. Then you do not have to pray in. You do not have to work your way in. You, I, I say you do pray in by saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. But you don't have to beg and, and bow and do all kinds of things. Uh, to become instantly a, a, which are at Ephesus. Now these people were in a town called Ephesus. So this letter is to the church at Ephesus. To those saints and all others as well and for all time. Wow. He said, you saints that are at Ephesus, I'm writing this directly to you but it's going to be penned down in a book one day called the Bible. And it's going to be for all of the saints from now until Christ comes back. This word, these words are going to be for all of the saints. You're just the first ones. You're like the eye of the needle. And we're putting the thread through the eye of the needle. And Ephesus was like the eye of the needle there. And the thread of Jesus Christ being threaded through. Imagine that. The faithful. Listen to, to ever faithful in the uh, making of the cross to be the object of one's faith. The cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus hung on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. To the crowd. He said they forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Only the Savior could say that. And then he went, he went into the grave and he walked back out. And three days later he walked back on the earth and talked with many and did miracles and did things. He said, grace be unto you and peace. And you know how that comes? How does grace and peace come? It comes through the cross by the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's how it comes. Uh, for, for God the Father, a privilege of untold proportion. God the Father will give you privileged as much as you want. How much grace do you want? He will give you all the grace that you want and all that you need if you're following Him and you use that grace for Him. And that's what you're supposed to do. Use that grace for Him. Which came by the means of the cross from God our Father. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. This proclaims Savior in association with the Father. That is the Son and the Father. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We are a body, a soul, and a spirit. Our soul and spirit will go to heaven when our body goes to the grave. One day God will raise that body up and is going to join it with the soul and the spirit. How we will look, I have no idea. 
Uh, why he would use this body again, I have no idea. Except that he's going to pull it out of the earth so it won't be left in this earth where hell is going to be. Hell is going to be in the heart of this earth. And one day God's going to take this earth and hell and he's going to cast it into another lake of fire to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Never stop burning. Never stop falling. Never stop turning. No end to it. And that's what God's going to do with it. Let's look at the spiritual blessings here that start in verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God. I wish it ever bless the Lord for what He has done for us. So He said, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God is the Father of Christ as Christ is seen in humanity. Now when we use the word Christ, we're using His check writing name. I've used this statement before. I don't know how it's very well accepted or not. But I have a name. I'm Peter Hutchins. And when I sign a check, though, I may sign Mr. Peter Hutchins. And uh, Christ, when he was Christ Jesus, Christ was his flesh part. Jesus was his glorified body in God. That God gave him from a, from a miraculous birth. A miraculous conception in Mary. God, she was a virgin. And God, impregnating her by the Holy Spirit, put Jesus in her to be born as, in, in a manger as a baby. And so he was a miraculous person who has, been, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And this is even with a blessing of anointing. Jesus anointed us on the cross and in the heavenly places in Christ. So now he, as Christ, is sitting down beside the Father in the fleshly body. And he is the Spirit that has the ability to be everywhere omniscient. It's called omniscience. He's omniscient. He's everywhere at one time, anywhere. You don't see air, but it's everywhere. You don't see the air out right here. It's everywhere, and you just breathe it. All you want. Well, that's the way with Christ. He's everywhere. You want some of Him? Ask Him. He'll come. And He will sup with you and you with Him if you're on the right plane. You've got to be right with God, right with Jesus in order to have that divine blessing. It's His ground. And it was His reason for going to the cross that you and I could be on this ground. And it's ours by reason of being in Him. He has given it to us, which was brought about by the cross so that we could inherit the earth. God made the earth for man. And He made Adam and Eve. He made man. And He gave him the earth and He put him on the earth. And man sinned. According to as He has chosen us in Him. This does not refer to just being special chosen people. No. This means that all people that ask Jesus to forgive of their sin and come into heart can be saved and will become His children. So that's what makes you special. And He purposes for every person that's chosen. There's a purpose for you if you're chosen. God had a purpose for me before I became a Christian. When I was a wicked sinner out there drinking, drunk, driving, doing all those things, God had a purpose for me in life. And He brought it about in 1972 at 3 o'clock in the morning. Before the foundation of the world, as God was the creator, and as he was laying his plan for the world, he had purpose of redeeming grace. He was going to have 
redeeming grace. You haven't got to go off, fellow. He's going to have redeeming grace. And that grace is in view for you and I today. That we should be holy, without blame, before Him in love. Let's look how that presents the purpose of being chosen. What is the purpose of being chosen? The purpose is having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. He already predestinated us unto the adoption of children. This does not refer to individual beings being predestinated as to whether he will be saved or lost, but rather the manner in which one becomes a child of God by Jesus Christ and in himself. That's where the predestination lies. He was predestinated to come to give himself that you and I could by saying, God, I am a sinner, forgive me of my sin, get him into my heart, that we could go where he is. And we can go live with him forever. It said, by Jesus Christ to himself. And this was by the means of the cross, of course. According to the good pleasure of his will. Now, that was an act of sovereignty. He is a sovereign God. What do you mean? That means he's all-knowing. He's almighty. He's all-everything. And it, he based it all on love for mankind. As you know, you say, see that God did not kill Adam. When Adam sinned, God did not say, I'm going to just kill you dead, Adam, and start over again. No. He said to Adam, I'm going to make a way for you to ask me to come into you and work through you and I'm not going to kill your fleshly, your body. I'm not going to kill your dead. But he did kill him in the spirit. And the spirit left him that originally he had and the spirit of the devil took over. And to the praise and glory of God's grace now, uh, the ultimate reason wherein he has made us and accepted. That's made it possible by the cross that he has accepted us in the beloved. That's in Christ. So what is Ephesians talking about? Ephesians 1. What have we talked about? We've talked about being accepted by a God that spoke this earth into existence. And how he made that acceptance come about, he had a battle with the devil because of Adam's first sin. So now Jesus went to the cross to bring us back to what God gave Adam and Eve. He gave them freedom on this earth, freedom to roam and run on this earth, freedom to do the things that they wanted to do or whatever, except for eating of that tree of good and evil. Now God says the same thing to you and I. He says, now I've saved you. Stay away from that place, the good and evil. You only have the good side to follow. Do not partake of the evil side. Do not partake of that. As we go on, we're going to read in uh, chapter 2 about those who will not go to heaven. Those that will not go to heaven would be those that choose to eat from the sinful tree rather than the spiritual tree. By the way, these books, the Bible, these are the spiritual tree. These are the spiritual tree right here. This is the book we are to eat from. This is the tree we are to eat from. Some people say to me, Pete, when you get home right, what do you do for fun? I say, I study. <laughs> well, no, I ain't what I mean. I mean, what do you do for fun? I say, I study. I watch discs, and I watch tapes, and I watch preachers, and I watch professors of colleges, and I, I watch about things, and I watch about the Bible, and I get the Bible down and I read the Bible, and I study. And I, and I get on the YouTube, and I do things on the YouTube. Well, 
I still wonder what you're going to do for fun. That is what I'm doing for fun. That is my fun. That's where my fun lies. Let's look at verse 8. Wherein he has abounded toward us. Can you imagine a finite God, the creator God, abounding toward one of us, you and me, reaching out to us and saying, hey, if you follow my book, I'll make you have a good life and a prosperous life and a happy life and a healthy life if you follow my book. See, he's made us acceptable by dying on the cross for us. And he redeemed us and he gave us that forgiveness and it's all according to his riches which boils down to his grace wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence a word with great weight. Prudence is to solve each moment of time. He solves each this 60 minutes in an hour and this 60 seconds in a minute. That's 360 uh, seconds in an hour. So what do we do with the, that time? I, I, have this, I have this thing in my life. This is something I think about. God said, if you make a dollar, ten cents belongs to him. That's one dime. If you make ten dollars, one dollar belongs to him. That's one dollar. If you make a hundred dollars, ten dollars belongs to God. That's ten percent. There's also 168 hours in a week. And he said, we owe him ten percent of our time. That means I owe God 16.8 hours a week in direct work, in direct contact. I happened to the Lord on the door this week and gave me some grace that I was able to go to the church and work for eight hours today. I was able to work for eight hours Tuesday, uh, Wednesday. I was able to work eight hours Tuesday. I entertained company Monday, which was the last couple hours of the entertaining the company was spiritual work. Watching a tape on the tabernacle and feeding a group of people, young and old alike. And so our hours are count. They count. And 16.8 hours a week we owe to God. If, if God said right now, I need you to start paying up. Some of you might would have to work three times that a week to ever catch up to where you haven't been. And you could never catch up unless you burned up the 16.8 hours for that week that you owe. So, we need to start thinking about that. Look, this dispensation in the fullness of time. According to his good pleasure, he purposed us to be born in this period of time. And he purposes for us in this dispensation to follow the fullness of time. I do believe, I do believe, if you study the Old Testament and you get Daniel's statue out, and you see that at the end, the bottom of his statue, there are ten toes. And those ten toes are mixed with iron and clay. What does that mean? That means that they could be blown apart at any given minute. I can tell you, do you want to see just a little bit of a picture of something like that? We are today in October, like the second maybe. And we are in um, the place of the earth. And there's a place in California where there's a fire. And that fire is lapping up everything in its path. And it's a warning to you and I that the power of God can supersede the power of man. 
I don't care how many firemen they send out there right now. If God wants to blow a wind down there at, at 100 miles an hour and whoop that flame until it goes down there and burns a city, he can do it. Why is he burning that particular area? I can't say. But I can say this. There are areas in this world where God is going to deal with sin in a terrible, forceful way. And this one little bitty fire in California we see is nothing compared to the day when this earth will burn. One day this earth will burn. We talk about these little old bombs that man has made. That when one goes off, it, like that one did uh, back in World War II and took a whole city out. You could take one of those bombs and drop them in the largest city in the United States and there would be nothing left. Nothing. No people, no buildings, no bricks, no trees, no shrubs, no grass. It wiped everything clean. Just like it wasn't there. Just one of those bombs. Just, that's it. It can happen. But one day, it's going to happen with God. God's going to wipe the slate clean. And when He does it, it's going to be more furious than that bomb. He has purposed God in His good pleasure, which He has purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, that He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth and even in Him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, whose work all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise of his glory. Woo! Man. What a statement. This proclaims that which is guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Not what is hoped to be, but what is guaranteed to be. Who first trusted in Christ. We will, uh, we will attend all by the first trusting in Christ, which means accepting what he did for us at the cross. In whom, that's Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth. I'm telling you today the word of truth. If you're watching this tidbit, I'm reading to you out of this Bible the truth. That if you do not ask Jesus Christ into your heart before you die, you will burn in hell forever. And all he's telling you in this chapter right here, of one of Ephesians, is that it's not his will that you should die and go to hell. But it's his will that you not only should accept him and you should have a good life on this earth. You can have a good life on this earth by following Jesus. By putting away the things of the world. By try, try sometime. Take your lawnmower. Listen to Brother Peter. God kind of burdened me this week about doing this myself. Just take your lawnmower and walk out of your driveway with it and walk down the street. See an unkept lawn. Crank your lawnmower up and mow, mow the lawn. Go ahead, crank it up and mow the lawn. If somebody comes out and questions you, say, the Lord told me to do it. Say, God told me to come mow your lawn and I'm mowing it. And if you want to, you can keep up with your hours and put it down toward your 16.8 hours that you owe the Lord. 
get that grass mowed, hand that lady or man or whoever's there a track out of your pocket. If you've got pockets, you should have some tracks in your pockets. And I have a few, but where they are, the Lord's the only one that knows. Like this, a track that says if you died right now, would you go to heaven? And inside it has the plan of salvation. And hand that to him. And if you have one with your church name on there and you're not ashamed of your church, hand the one with your church name on there. And then maybe the following Sunday they'll come down and come to your church. You know that. Do you know that what's wrong with the Christians today is we're not proving ourselves? We're saying we're Christians. Do we prove it? I was listening to two men today that did an experiment, a live experiment. They got bums clothes on, rags, and they went down on the corner to see how they would be treated. And they found out they were treated with disdain. And who were they treated with disdain from? Some by preachers. Some by godly men. They said they went to this church that was preparing a table to feed a bunch of these same kind of fellows. And they were in the church, sitting in the church there waiting. And a deacon came in there and ran them out of the church. He said, get out of here. Go on. Get out. Go. Get. But they didn't leave. They sat there a little while. And here he came back an hour or so later and said, get. Well, the next day, they were supposedly to speak in the church. So they came up and spoke what they think of Christians, what Christians do and how Christians act and told me a little example of how they were treated yesterday. Because they were in those clothes they were in. Now here's two men that just put the clothes on. Just to experiment. If we as Christians treat street people like that, how can we say that we're godly? How can we say we've read this book of Ephesians, and the age, we know this is the age... And we know that if we don't speak to these people and tell them about Jesus, they may die and go to hell. And, and why should they die and go to hell? Just because they have rags on? Just because they've lost their way in the world and, and, they, don't, and they can't seem to find their way out of it? No. They need Jesus just as much as anybody else. I've won a many and many and many of these type of people to the Lord. Many of them. Gave them a few dollars on a Bible. And said try your best to follow this. Where are they today? I don't know where they are today. They're all over the world. They're hitchhiking down the road. But I suspect many of them found a church. And I suspect many of them are in a church. And I suspect many of them are doing the same thing I did. Because they learned from me that that's the way to do it. The average American today that I work around drinks enough coffee and enough soft drinks a day to give out probably four to five dollars a day they could give out. They could make that bottle of tea at home and take it with them and give that money out to somebody who they think needs it. And pass a track out with it. I've had a little track passing today, several people. I've passed several tracks today to several different people. And that's what we're supposed to do. That we're in this age to come. And the kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, we are to pass on. Look at what he says in verse 7. That in the age to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Has God ever had you just take a couple hundred dollars and fold it up and shake somebody's hand and put that couple hundred dollars in their hand? 
somebody you see is being evicted out of a house, somebody you know that hasn't, it isn't, isn't following God or hasn't followed God or hasn't even gave God a thought. And you say, maybe this will help you out of your hard place. Put a couple hundred dollars in the hand. You say, are you serious, Pete? Yeah, I'm serious as a heart attack. It would be the best $200 you ever sowed. be the best seeds you ever sowed. Those seeds are going to grow up and be a big tree someday. The Bible said, and the birds will land in the tree. <laughs> oh, I see so many pictures in my mind of that. For by grace are you saved through faith. Why should you not use that grace and pass it on? And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. What did God lay down? What did he put in his hand and say here? He said, I, I went to the cross and I shed my blood for you. And I'm willing to put my blood over you that I shed on the cross. They spit on me and they pulled my beard out. And they cussed me. And they slapped my face. And they punched me and said, If you be the Son of God, tell which one of us punched you. Which one of us slapped you. Which one of us spit on you. And he got up there on that cross with them nails in his hands and his feet. And he looked down at that crowd and he said, God, my Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How about that? And you and I talk about two little hundred dollars. Wow. Look, God is on the throne. He will meet your need. If you have a need, He'll meet your need. You meet somebody else's need, He'll double meet your need. I guarantee it. I started out November 5th, 1972, 3 o'clock in the morning, a lost man, drunk, wrecked my car and God saved me. I said, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner, come in and save my soul. The very next Sunday I got baptized in a, in a church that immersed me and raised me up. I said, buried with him in baptism and raised to do what? Walk in newness of life. Walk in newness of life. No more alcohol. No more cigarettes, no more lying, cheating, no more poker games. No more doing what I was doing. But become new. The next, very next Sunday, I was preaching in the jailhouse. And I preached in the jailhouse for seven years. And I had a Bible school in there. And the Bible school, many of those guys, when they walked out of that jailhouse, they walked out of their preachers. They went in, lost and in sin, and walked out of there saved and preachers. Every now and then I meet one and say, Hey, preacher, hey, you remember me? I say, No, I can't. For a foggy, I can't remember you. Well, I was in prison. I said, That's why I didn't remember you. I always tried to not remember that somebody was in prison. But I met them on the street. Hey, the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles, or sinners, in the flesh, who were called uncircumcised, by that which we call the circumcision of the flesh made by hands, uh, that at that time you were without Christ and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant and the promise having no hope and without God in the world. Let's boil this down to today. 
to today, we're hanging on to the world. And when I got saved November 5th, 1972, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was circumcised from the world. I was circumcised from the world, cut off from the world. God cut me off. He said, no more. No more poker games, no more of this, no more cussing, swearing, no more of this, no more of this, no more of this. You're circumcised from that. You are no longer now a sinner and working in the world as a sinner. But you were a sinner saved by grace. And just to show that you are really saved, you, you've got to cut the world off. So we cut the world off. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall and petition between us, having abolished the flesh. What did God circumcise me from when I got saved? From the idol worship of the flesh? From all of those things that I worshipped in the flesh? I spent more money in the flesh on, on evil trash probably than I have since I've been saved. Just pleasing the flesh. 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 Can you look in the mirror right now and say, I'm not just pleasing the flesh? Can you look in the mirror and say, I'm not just pleasing the flesh? And not say to yourself, you're a liar? Have you ever had a conversation in the mirror? And see who you really are? And see if you are living in the flesh? And all your money goes to the flesh? I used to ride by houses when I was visiting. And I'd see a young Christian. He got in the church. God started to bless him. He got a good job. Started making good money. All of a sudden... A boat appeared in his yard. It wasn't long. Where is so and so? I think he went fishing today. And then I go by the same house, and there's a camper. And now we haven't seen so and so for a month. Where is he? Oh, he took his camper and his boat, and he went out west going fishing. So, I go visit Mr. So-and-so and I say, Sir, do you realize that the devil has taken these things of pleasure and pulled you away from the church house? And sometimes they'd say to me, Hey, mind your own business. I'd say, This is my business. God sent me over here to tell you. The destruction is just around the corner. It wouldn't be long that I see the house up for sale. No boat, no camper, no new car, no wife, no children. Separated. Gone their own ways. What happened? They spit in God's face. And God said, you can't spit in my face and get away with it. Because I control everything. I allowed you to have that freedom. And you took it and ran with it the wrong way. And because of that, you're not going to be able to reunite with me the way you want to right now. You're going to have to get humble. And look what he says here. Having abolished his flesh, the enmity, even the law and the commandments containing the ordinances, for to make him of himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both 
unto God in the body, in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them who were nigh, both at the same time. For through him we both have access through one Spirit unto one Father. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the man that has backslid and he's in his fleshly way and he's miserable and he's having a hard life. If he'll say, God, forgive me. I backslid. I'm here where I am. I'm in the ditch. I'm in the gutter. And I'm in this place. Will you help me out? And he can start over again. God's that gracious. He's gracious enough if you've been out wandering in your way that he'll take you back. My suggestion to you who are not wandering right now, take heed to what's been said. Get some money going toward the church, at least your 10%, if nothing else. And then part of your 10% of time, it may take a while for you to work up to 16.8 hours, divide it out. You can sit at your table in the morning for one hour and read the Bible and get an hour on that time. You can sit there at night and read and get another hour on that time. That's two. And so you owe him 16.8 a week. Not in one day, but a week. So you've got a whole week to work that out and get to where you need to be. And then you've got a whole week to think about getting your 10% in there. Let's look at verse 21. Let's uh, verse, excuse me, 20. And I built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Who are they? They are the, the prophets were before the apostles that prophesied what we needed to do and what was going to happen and how Jesus was going to come. And then we had the prophets come and tell us, uh, excuse me, the prophets told us and then we have Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone, tell us, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into an holy temple in the Lord. I'm the holy temple of the Lord. If you ask Jesus into your heart, you're supposed to be a holy temple in the Lord too. What are you supposed to put down? You're supposed to put down all the things you did before you got saved that weren't of God, that were worldly, that were fleshly, that were just for you. Just for you. Just for you. Just for you. I see so many people today living just for self, Just for self, Just for self. Nobody else. Just follow this all day long. It's about me, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me. What I want, what I want, what I want, what I want, what I want. <coughs> Until you start thinking about somebody else, you'll never be happy. And whom you also are built together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. Do you know that's the lost person and the saved person? We're out here cohabiting together here. On this earth, we're cohabiting. You would like to see that lost person get saved? If you would, you've got to start acting like you would. You've got to start putting down the selfish things and get the things going that are godly. He's the one that's going to make it work. In whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. What is a habitation? That's God in you. God in you. Wow. That's as important as having blood in you to make this body work. It's as important to have God in you to make the spiritual life work. Your spiritual life will not work without God in you. I, I, my Sunday school teacher, he's, he has a, he's a classic example of a person who got in a church of good works. And he said, because I sweep the floor 
I'm one of the head guys. Because I sweep the floor. God's put me ahead of the rest of you. It's not in works. It's in obedience. No matter how many times you swept the floor. I, a man told me one day, he said, Hey, Pete. And I said, yeah. He said, you know how I know I'm going to heaven? I said, how, how do you know, mister? And I won't say his name. How, you, how, how, do, how do you know you're going? He said, because for 50 years, I've made coffee for my Sunday school class every single Sunday for 50 years. So I'm going to heaven. I told him, that won't work. Only through Jesus Christ can you go to heaven. I was at another church painting. I was a paint contractor. I'm down there painting. The man who mowed the grass died, and they had the funeral. And the preacher got up and said, if anybody in this world ever went to heaven, this man did. He mowed the grass for 75 years. He mowed this grass and this property for 75 years. I don't care if he mowed it for 975 years. That's not what gets you into heaven. What gets you into heaven is saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. It's not of works, the Bible said, lest any man boast. If it was of works, the guy that mowed the grass for 75 years surely would have beat the guy that made coffee for 50 years, wouldn't he? Because his works were more. So you see how foolish it would be for it to be by works? So it's not by works. It's by the grace of God giving you salvation on a platter as a free gift if you'll say the right words. Which is, I am a sinner. Forgive me my sin. Come in my heart. Save my soul. That's it. I would be dead and in hell today had I not bowed my head November 5th, 1972 at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'd be dead and in hell today. God showed me that before I asked him to save me. He said, your number's up, boy. You done walk the last thing you're going to do against me and my kingdom. You're either going to get right right now or you're going to die or you're going to be in prison the rest of your life. And I'm not going to speak to you again. If you should be watching this and you're at that point to where you may not be spoken to again, you better heed what's being said. This has been a little bit lengthy. I'm at 47, 48 minutes. It's been a little lengthy. This is a 30 minute thing and it's been 48. So I'm going to pray with you and I'm going to say goodbye. Most precious Heavenly Father, I do pray for those who are watching this right this moment, Lord, today. Whatever time it is, or whatever, wherever they are, God, I pray you'd speak to their heart. Pray you'd help them to say this little prayer. God, I, forgive me, I am a sinner. Come in my heart and save my soul. That they may be able to start a new life, Lord, and to follow you into the old kingdom of heaven forever and ever. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.